So I'm going to talk about four themes today. The first one is how to deal with adversities. This chapter is titled Bali Maharaj being arrested by the Lord. And while I'm going to talk about these adversities, I want to talk about four separate pastimes, uh, Parikshit Maharaj, Prahlad Maharaj, Bali Maharaj, and the gopis. The second theme I want to talk about is how we can redirect our consciousness from material to spiritual and how that alone is a miracle of Krishna consciousness. The third theme I want to talk about is while I'm talking about these pastimes, if you can meditate on where the Lord's footprints actually reside. Now in this particular pastime, we see that the Lord places his foot on Bali Maharaj's head. So externally, we can say that the Lord's footprint resided on Bali Maharaj's head. But in a more subtle sense, where does the Lord's footprints reside? And finally, today is the auspicious disappearance day of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Chakur. So time permitting, I will speak some pastimes uh, on Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Chakur. So let's start with the first topic of adversities. So Srimad Bhagavatam has a series of narratives on how pure devotees faced adversities. So we'll talk about Parikshit Maharaj first, then we'll talk about Prahlad Maharaj, then Bali Maharaj, and finally the gopis. Now, in one sense, Parikshit Maharaj made a very minor mistake and he had to face a very big adversity. So amongst all adversities, the adversity of death is the worst, at least in the material sense. So in the Bhagavatam, Sukadev Goswami helps Parikshit Maharaj prepare for death by narrating how great devotees have faced difficulties throughout history. So let's talk a little bit more about adversities. So when adversities come in our lives, um, the first thing, the first question that comes to mind is what did I do to deserve this? But these exalted souls, these pure devotees also question this, but they question it slightly differently. They say, what did I do to deserve this mercy? Why me? What did I do to deserve this special mercy is what they question. So let's look at Parikshit Maharaj again. So Parikshit Maharaj made a very minor mistake or very small mistake of placing a dead snake around Shamikrasi. And because of this, he received a severe punishment that, or a curse that he would die in seven days. So this is an example where you can say that Parikshit Maharaj made a small mistake. Now let's look at another example of Prahlad Maharaj, where you can say externally, he did not make any mistake. So is devotion the solution for adversities? So typically we think that this world is full of problems and we go to God for relief from these problems. We expect devotion to give us relief in the material sense by solving the problem or in the spiritual sense by giving us the strength to tolerate the problem. Now let's look at Parik uh, Prahlad Maharaj. In Prahlad Maharaj's case, Devotion itself was the cause of the problem. If he had given up the devotion, then he could have lived a happy life. He was a beloved son of the emperor of the universe. And if he had just given up devotion, he could have been happy, but he did not. So Prahlad Maharaj didn't do anything wrong and still faced adversities. So adversities will come upon us, whether we are Parikshit Maharaj, whether we are Prahlad Maharaj, or Bali Maharaj, a demon like Bali Maharaj, or even the gopis. So adversities will come, but how we face these adversities is what these pure devotees teach us. So devotion is the solution for handling adversities, but not preventing adversities. Now let's look at a slightly more difficult test. So again, the theme is, so initially Parikshit Maharaj made a small mistake. Prahlad Maharaj made no mistakes. 
Now let's look at a slightly more difficult or a tougher test which Bali Maharaj had to face. Now the, in the case of Bali Maharaj, it was not the devotion, it was the Lord himself who was against him. So the Lord himself apparently seems to be causing adversities to him. So Bali Maharaj wants to be truthful, Satyavak it's called, he wants to be truthful in his promise to giving charity to the Lord. So he wants to give something to the Lord and he wants to be truthful. So this is on a positive side, right? And the Lord apparently takes away everything by deception. Not only that, the Lord is apparently persecuting him, arresting him and humiliating him. So given these trying circumstances, how did he remain faithful at such a time? So this is definitely a slightly more tougher test than what Prahlad Maharaj had to face. Now let's look at the ultimate test which the gopis had to face. The gopis love for Krishna and it was amidst rejection by Krishna himself. So gopis gave up everything for Krishna and Krishna gives them up. So if you think about it, several thousand years ago in a very conservative society, they took a big risk by rejecting their family, society, everything for Krishna. And finally, when they go to Krishna, Krishna rejects them, but they never gave up their devotion. Uh, there is this uh, from the Gopi Geet. Pati Sutanvaya Bhatra Bandavan Ati Vilangyate Antya Chutkata Gati Vidastavod Gita Mohita Gita Vayoshita Kastya Jennishi. The translation Dear Achyuta, you know very well why we have come here. Who but a cheater like you would abandon young women who come to see you in the middle of the night, enchanted by the Lord, the loud sound of his flute. Just to see you, we have completely rejected our husbands, pati, children, sutta, ancestors, brothers, and other relatives. So here we see, this is the highest devotion because this is a devotion amidst rejection. So why is this so difficult? So I was uh, doing some research about the fears in the 21st century. There are two fears that were not there earlier in other centuries that have emerged in the 21st century in the top 10. So one of them is fear of terrorists and the other is the fear of being rejected. So these two have made it to the top 10 in the 21st century. So what does this mean? So to maintain devotion amidst rejection is very difficult. And Bali Maharaj pastime, the gopis pastime actually depicts that. So now let's focus back on Bali Maharaj. So Bali Maharaj was a very principled Kshatriya. Now he says that I have given my promise of charity and I must be truthful, Satyavak on the level of morality. At that point, when he's making this promise, there is no devotion. So what does the Lord do? Out of his causeless mercy, he removes everything that he had. He made him penniless, friendless, and even guruless. So that morality that he had was actually removed and he had no choice but to surrender completely to the Lord. So there's a huge elevation of consciousness from no devotion to extreme surrender that happens in Bali Maharaj's case. And that is why he is an exemplar of complete surrender or Atma Nivedana. So what is the mercy of the Lord here? The mercy of the Lord here is that the Lord made him give up his morality and surrender completely to the Lord. So let us look at it from a more practical sense. What keeps us inspired to fight life's battles. So we all have adversities, we all have challenges, problems. So what keeps us inspired to go on in spite of these 
challenges. So all of us have some purpose which inspire us to keep fighting life's battles. So I uh, deal with a lot of students uh, through some college outreach and I ask all of them, what is your life's purpose? And the answer that I get typically is, um, I want a particular job, I want this particular career, I want a huge mansion and so on. So they have that purpose. And because of the purpose, they're able to overcome problems in their lives. They have to wake up early, they have to deal with difficult professors and so on. So they're able to overcome these problems because of that purpose. Now let's look at an, uh, another example of family. Let's say someone has a sense of purpose by taking care of his family. And because of that purpose, he's able to undergo, he or she is able to undergo several austerities. Another example could be athletes. Now the purpose or the goal of an athlete could be to win the Olympic gold medal. Now with that purpose in mind, they undergo severe austerities, waking up early, having a very strict diet and so on. Now that leads us to the question, does having a proper purpose inspire us to fight all life's battles, all life's problems that are put on us? The purpose helps us overcome our problems, but is that always the case? Let's look at examples where this may not always be the case. What if the problems themselves overpower our sense of purpose? Let's take two uh, examples. Let's take a wealthy man uh, whose purpose was to become rich. And what if a stock market crash happens? All that, uh, the purpose that he was living for is completely shattered. The problem that he's facing now is overpowering his purpose. Another example, let's take a family man and uh, due to some misfortune, he loses his family members. Now again, the sense of purpose that he had of taking care of the family is stripped off at that moment. And then he or she starts to question, what am I living for? Because now that purpose is gone, they start questioning, why am I living? What is my purpose? I've lost my purpose and so on. And they tend to get towards depression and even suicidal tendencies. So Bali Maharaj also strived to live honorably. That was his purpose. He was a principal Kshatriya. He wanted to live honorably and he was totally dishonored. For a king, dishonor is worse than death. So he was humiliated, dishonored, not just in private, but in public in front of his loved ones. So we need a purpose that is bigger than any problem. If we have a purpose, a spiritual purpose that is bigger than any problem that we face in this material world, then that is ideal. So as I mentioned, when problems become bigger than the purpose, we can go into depression, but it is our purpose that gives us the momentum. So choosing the right purpose is the key here. So a spiritual purpose puts our consciousness in the right direction. So if you think of consciousness as water, our consciousness flows in the direction of our attachments. If you wanna see where your attachments are, try to remain idle for a few minutes and see where your thoughts go. That is where your consciousness is flowing. So consciousness flows in the direction of our attachments. So I'll give you three examples. The first one is Bilva Mangal Thakur. So Bilva Mangal Thakur, his consciousness was completely towards Chintamani. So, and lust actually captivated him. It was only when that road was blocked when that consciousness flow was blocked, that he could completely channel it towards God. Another example is Gajendra. So Gajendra, when he was in the elephant form, uh, his main attachment was towards his family and he was very prestigious that he was the king of all the elephants and so on. And that is where his consciousness flowed. But when he was captured by the crocodile, 
that is when that got blocked that consciousness flow towards his family and towards maintaining high prestige got blocked and he was able to channel that consciousness towards god at that point because of the latent devotion that he had which he got from his previous life another example which is today's example is bali maharaj for him the consciousness or his attachment was towards being wealthy being honorable and so on and the lord himself had to come to block that consciousness to block that that flow of consciousness towards his attachment so that he could channel completely towards the lord and this redirection of consciousness is the miracle of krishna consciousness just like how we have a gps in our car we can take several wrong turns but the gps always redirects us towards the right destination so moment by moment we have this opportunity to turn completely to the to god and that is the miracle of krishna consciousness so let's talk a little bit more about redirection re- redirection of consciousness so prahlad maharaj calls this ability to redirect of uh, our consciousness as krishna's mercy so mercy is that in every situation the jiva has the opportunity to turn towards him whether we are facing adversities whether we are in the gap between these surges of adversities we have the opportunity to turn towards god and uh, bishma in the first canto very nicely puts this and he says everything is within krishna's plan he doesn't say everything is krishna's plan everything is within krishna's plan and so bishma also says that when there is every reason for a relationship to be broken but still it is not broken that is when love is real so prahlad maharaj had every reason to break his relationship he could have lived happily if he had given up his devotion um the gopis had every reason to break the relationship but because but they did not do it and that is the real love which is such a contrast to love that is in this material world so there are three lessons that i quickly want to share the first lesson is let's not focus just on those moments when adversity is come let's focus on the gaps between these surges the gaps could be now where we are peaceful where we are happy if we focus on developing that consciousness trying to move the flow of our consciousness towards krishna then when the surges eventually come upon us we'll be able to handle it in a very mature and a very a practical way so also the second lesson is that we may be products of the past but we are not prisoners of the past as i said at any moment we can come out of this prison by turning towards god and finally Uh, for those of us who have been practicing krishna consciousness for a long time i can say that uh, the sense of wanting to grow spiritual grow spiritually gets lost due to complacency over time so the sense of earnestness that we had initially tends to go away with time so somehow we have to be wanting to have the need to grow spiritually all the time so we must somehow maintain the sense of earnestness even in the gaps between the surges so now let's move to the second theme of the lord's footprint as i said in this particular past time the lord's footprints were placed on bali maharaj's head but in a more subtle sense where do these footprints go so it is explained in the ninth canto of shrimad bhagavatam uh, this is in the context of uh, the ramayan pastime in the bhagavatam where it is mentioned lord ramachandra placed those lotus feet in the hearts of those who always think of him so the lord's feet are actually residing in our acharyas they are residing in every single acharya of the guru parampara 
So one way to access the lotus feet of the Lord is to take shelter of these wonderful exemplary acharyas. So in that context, today is a very auspicious day. It is the disappearance day of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasri Thakur. Let's quickly recite the pranam mantra. Namo Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale, Srimate Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Iti Namine, Sri Varsha Bhanavi Devi Dayataya Kripabde, Krishna Sambandha Vigyana Daine Prabhave Namaha, Madhur Yojvala Premadya, Sri Rupanuga Bhaktida, Sri Gaura Karuna Shakti Vigrahaya Namostute, Namaste Gauravani Sri Murtaye Dina Tarine, Rupanuga Virudhapa Siddhanta Dvantaharine. So I'll just mention some of the past times, which many of you may already know very quickly. Uh, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur was born on 6th of February, 1874 in Jagannath Puri. As he came out of the womb, the umbilical cord was around his neck, just like a Brahmin thread, which signified immediately that this was a very special soul. In the spiritual world, he's a manjari called Nayan Mani Manjari. He was the fourth child of Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur. He was named Bimala Prasad because Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur was praying for a ray of Vishnu. And he was praying specially uh, to Bimala Devi. And uh, that is why he was called Bimala Prasad. And of course, we know this famous pastime of how the Ratyatra cart stopped in front of their house for three days. And uh, this was when uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasri Thakur was only five months old. And when Bhagavati brought him and placed him near the feet of Lord Jagannath and he touched the feet of Lord Jagannath, immediately a garland fell on Bhimala Prasad. Also, we know that when he was just seven years old, he was well versed in the Bhagavad Gita. In fact, he had memorized all 700 verses and he, he could give not just, he just didn't memorize the verses, but he could give detailed explanation on any verse. He was a scholar in astrology and astronomy. He was known as the living encyclopedia. It is said that uh, just like how we go to a library to read one or two books, he would go into a library to read all the books of a particular library. And uh, interestingly, even though he was asked several times to make predictions because he is such an expert in astrology and astronomy, he always said it's Hari's will. And of course, later on, we know that he resolved to chant 1 billion names of Krishna. That is uh, 192 rounds every day for, and he did this for about nine years. So in the remaining time that we have, I just uh, mentioned four pastimes or lessons that we can take uh, from Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasri Chakur. And these are all taken from uh, the magazines and books like the harmonist and so on. So I'm just going to read a couple of them. So the first one is on compassion. And this one is on giving charity to the poor. So Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur was traveling from Orissa with his disciples. On one day, as he was coming back from Shakshi Gopal's temples, uh, some people on the way asked for alms from the married men who accompanied Srila Prabhupada, but none of them gave anything. So Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur became annoyed by, the, by their behavior and he instructed them. He said, if married men think I must not give any of my money, which I, have, which I consider reserved for Krishna, for the poor and deprived, then they're really showing symptoms of wretchedness, cruelty, and lack of compassion for others. They should not consider that giving charity to the poor is a fruitful activity. This kind of mentality shall make their hearts hard and they will suffer of greed. As a result of this, they shall not want to spend their money, not even on devotional service to the Supreme Lord, which is the ultimate goal in life. They will invite offenses in the service. Also, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur mentions that serving prasad to others is the necessary duty of every married Vaishnava. So the next pastime 
is on the importance of hearing from one's own guru. So this was when uh, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Thakur was giving a talk in the temple. Uh, it had two halls, a lecture hall and a temple room. In the middle of the lecture, the conch sounded for Aarti. Some of the disciples stood up and went to the next room to watch the Aarti. They left the lecture to join the Aarti. Then they came back and sat down to hear the rest of the lecture. But Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Thakur stopped speaking and he said, where did you go? The disciples were a little proud and said, Oh, Guru Maharaj, we went to see Krishna on the altar. He got annoyed. Wrong, he said. No, you only saw stone. If you want to see Krishna, you must listen to me and hear from me. Then you can understand what Krishna is. And then there's this uh, another famous pastime of how Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasthakur showed extreme compassion towards his disciples. He really, really cared um, for his disciples. So this uh, pastime is about a brahmachari disciple who wanted to see his mother. So of course, this was this happened in Navadvip, in Mayapur Dham, and he wanted to visit his mother who was in Calcutta. So he requested this several times from his Guru Maharaj, and his Guru Maharaj kept telling him that no, I will not let you see your mother. He was a little annoyed by this, the disciple. And it so happened that later he developed a terminal disease and it was announced that he, was, he would be leaving his body in a few months. And at that point also, he requested his Guru Maharaj if he could see his mother. And even at that time, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasthakur said, no, you cannot see your mother, you just have to stay here. Then his condition got worse and he had only three days to live. At that point, he was instructed by his Guru Maharaj to meet his mother. It was very interesting. And then he did not want to go at that point. He said, I just have three more days to live. Why can't I just stay in the dham? But Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasthakur told his other disciples to take him to, so that he could see his mom, who was in Calcutta. So they had to go by train. And so happened that while they were taking him in the train to see his mother, he gave up his body. He gave up his body in the train. So the disciples were a little bewildered. They came back to Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasitakur and asked him, why? What happened here? He always wanted to see his mother and you did not let him uh, do that. And just when he was about to die, he was in the dam. That is when you sent him to see his mother. So Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasthakur with tears in his eyes, he said something very profound. He said that if he had died in the dam, his consciousness would have been directed towards his mother. But now that he was away from the dam, his consciousness was always thinking of the dam. So he died with the consciousness of the dam. So his consciousness was in the dam, when he left the world. So Krishna doesn't say where you die is important. Krishna says you are where your mind is. So we have three more minutes. I'll skip this pastime. And then I'll just mention some of the important contributions that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasi Thakur uh, performed. So he used to chastise cheaters and he was known as a great reformer of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. He preached against deviant Vaishnava sects, Sahajiyas and caste systems, which was one of his most important contributions. He met with several Acharya scholars and leaders of all types, and he was never defeated in argument. Some of his other contributions are that he established 64 temples in India, and he also established centers in Rangoon, um, London, and Germany. He called printing presses as Brihat Mridanga, and he established four printing presses. He published thousands of books, including Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Bhagavat, Chaitanya Mangal, and so on. He edited several Bhaktivinoda Thakur's books. And he wrote over 108 essays and books, plus hundreds of articles were published in his eight magazines and newspapers. 
and then he established Navadvip Dham Parikrama, which did not exist before his time, Rajamandal Parikrama, which was first done by Lord Chaitanya. Uh, and he found many pilgrimage sites and established Padapitas at pastime sites. One of his most interesting contributions was that he was a very um, amazing innovation, innovator. So he used modern technologies such as cars, radios, boats, etc., in the Lord's service, Yukta Vairagya. So he sent sannyasis overseas, which has never been done before. He used non-spiritual people to help the movement. And then he also created uh, displays and diorama exhibitions uh, in at least 10 occasions for, for approximately 15 days at a time, including toys, dolls, pictures, and mechanical devices to make these dolls. Finally, as far as his writings were concerned, he established devotional writing in three categories, Sambandha, relationship establishment, Abhideya, acting accordingly, and Prayojana, which is ultimate love of God. And in his own personal sadhana, uh, as I mentioned previously, he uh, took a Nam Bhajan vow of chanting 1 billion names or 192 rounds per day for nine years. He preached Daivi Varnashram and was endorsed by, uh, which was endorsed by Bhaktivinoda Thakur. And then finally, uh, he wrote an important paper ascertaining the relative positions of Brahmins and Vaishnavas, which led to the creation of the Gaudiya Mat. And he initiated disciples based on quality and not caste. Um, lastly, His Grace Amarendra Prabhu talks that uh, talks about how Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur um, was also, in one sense, like Vamande, because he also expanded his consciousness from a very small uh, space to a very large space. How he expanded his consciousness throughout his life. The consciousness was not against Kali, but against. Uh, was not against Bali, but against Kali. Uh, and then in the three steps, what are the three steps that uh, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur took? The first step is that he kicked out atheism. The second step, he stamped or kicked out impersonalism. And the third step is that he placed it on ritualistic mundane activities and raised the level of Raganuga Bhakti. I'll stop here. Prantraj Shri Mad Bhagavatam ki jai, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Hey, Gorkumar Prabhu, this, this was spectacular. Wonderful, Dulal wonderful class. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We were listening with rapt attention and I, I guess we're out of time for questions. Yes, Gaur Sharan yes, Prabhu? Yeah. 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 I okay, suppose. I'll ask you privately. <laughs> no problem. Please feel free to ask the question, Prabhuji. No problem. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Gorshan Prabhu. So, um, you know, this point, I never thought of it like that. That Prahlad Maharaj, uh, all he, he had to do to enjoy a so called good life was to give up his devotion, and his adversity was uh, actually because of his devotion, right? Um, and, and obviously he didn't give it up because he had love for Krishna. Now, my question is, um, you know, this is the age old question. Is the purpose of adversities to kick us out of our complacencies? Is, is that what happens? As I loved your point of what happens between the gaps, you know, in the gaps between adversities, we get comfortable and then we get, comf uh, you know, complacent. Is that why adversities happen so that um, we stop being complacent? So thank you for this question, Prabhu. I mean, it's different for different people. For some of us, we may need to go through those adversities. We may need to go through those challenges so that we can channel our consciousness towards Krishna. For some of us, this may not be necessary. We may be able to channel our attachments towards Krishna right from the get-go. So it's different for different people. And ultimately, if we keep taking shelter of Krishna, he gives us the right path. He may give us adversities. He may not give us adversities as long as we keep turning towards him like the GPS, always re trying to redirect our consciousness towards Krishna. Thank you. <laughs>